Thank you, thank you. I'm glad everyone grabbed pizza because I didn't want to be in between you guys and pizza. Did he say that it's going to be the same food next week? Is this from last week? Is this? Man, today, it's back on the menu. man, oh Pete, okay, well he had me when he said pizza, I knew I was going to come down here for free pizza. So anyway, as, as uh, Matt mentioned, I'm uh, Mark Campbell, class of 89, and I even have someone here that was my professor back then, and I have someone here that was in the dorms with me back then, and no, they're not allowed to tell any stories. <laughs> So the, the title of the presentation is, well, now you're in IT, or well, now you're in it. Um, and so I'm going to have a primary focus here on the IT industry, the computer science industry, the software industry. But of course, there's very few industries that software doesn't actually touch anymore. So I, I, I trust that this will be uh, extrapolatable. Is that like, that's a, that's a big college word, isn't it? Extrapolatable-ish-er. Um, to, to what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Is my advancer not working? I thought, I oh, look at this, hey. So, handsome guy, uh, uh, stunning uh, actor, model, uh, perfume designer. Uh, no, it's me. Uh, I graduated 89, as I mentioned, but, uh, and I found out my, my, my list is very incomplete here. So uh, my kids, I had a son and daughter. Uh, my son is actually still going to Adam State. He's on his eighth year of his, of his bachelor's degree. Uh, no, he's actually a freshman. I'm just teasing him. Uh, my wife went here. My mom went here and was a professor. She's sitting in the front, and she's known me since, well, before I was born. Um, and, uh, but uh, I also have a niece, uh, a sister, uh, so basically, they felt obligated by law that they had to invite me down here, right? And, and uh, they're going to cover my parking tickets and everything, so they had to let me speak. So I've been kicking around the IT industry for 27 years, much to my shame. Um, I've worked in all kinds of stuff, uh, from aerospace to telecommunications to software industries, to large corporations, small startups. Uh, I've actually worked in 16 different countries. I'm just one step ahead of the law, and I'm able to, to bounce around quite a bit. Uh, I've worked at uh, over 100 clients. I kind of stopped counting that. Somewhere along the line, someone uh, got tricked into giving me a master's degree and a couple patents. So uh, that's the bragging part of it. Cameron will say, that's the same guy that used to like shotgun beers, you know, <laughs> during midterm week. Like, like, is that, is that really? So what I do now, I'm currently director of research at a small little company called uh, Trace3. Uh, we'd like to say that our footprint is a lot bigger than our size. I write a lot of tech articles. I uh, travel the nation speaking at corporations, conferences, events, symposiums, uh, talking about the IT industry, the trends, and so forth, uh, at least that, that I'm seeing. Uh, I work a lot with the venture capital firms in the Silicon Valley. Uh, of the top 25 firms, I think I work with 23. So there's a couple out there that don't get the benefit of my wisdom. So I'm joking. Gosh, you guys are all serious and everything. So, uh, and believe it or not, I look at about 250 startups a year. Um, actually, last year, I think we looked at close to 1,500. Um, but I say that personally, I look, and if, uh, any math majors here? How many is that per work day? It works out about one per day. So that's about the schedule I'm. So there's an awful lot going on, um, and uh, I forget most of the stuff that I look at. So what I want to talk about is what uh, what lies ahead. So let's pretend that you're at Adam State, you're a computer science or IT student, you're looking to get into the industry. There's a lot of questions, and the reason I kind of picked this as the topic is because that was me. Right? I, uh, I I got involved way back in the way back, and uh, uh, Adam State was picked in 1986, I think, so just after the Civil War. See, you guys have heard all my material. They're like, he used that same stupid joke upstairs. But anyway, uh, by AT&T, I think it was University of Wisconsin-Madison and Adam State were selected as two test bed colleges to put these boxes. They were called 3B2s, and they ran some operating system called Unix, and they did this networking stuff with something called Ethernet, and they were developing these internet protocols. So this was back in the 80s. So when I heard about that, I was like, yeah, I'm doing Dawson Pascal. I'm not going to get involved in that at all, right? 
Little did I know that was, you know, a, a lot of the neophyte early fingerprints of what later became known as the internet. And so Adam State has a real rich history of that. Luckily, I had an advisor, Ron Lozier, uh, that promptly stepped in and said, no, you're actually going to take a class in C and you're going to take a class in Unix. And I told him 10 reasons why that wasn't a good idea. But he didn't listen to me. I took the classes and that allowed me to get my first job out of college. So I'm, I'm thankful that there were much smarter minds at work in my career than mine. So what will I do? This is kind of a breakdown uh, from one of the uh, research firms that we watch that talks about, you know, what the, uh, and, th and this is uh, looking at the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics field. Um, this is a question I asked upstairs in uh, uh, George Selman's class that, uh, you know, how many will think they will be coding? My, when I was graduating, I had taken so many coding classes, so many languages, I was extremely proud, you know, uh, of, of all the different languages I knew and the operating systems. And it turns out, other than just for a small fraction of my career, I, I don't code. I, 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 I mean, I dabble with it as a hobby, which makes me sound really geeky. But I mean, other than that, it, it's not something that I, that I really do. But that's great news, because there's a heck of a lot out there beyond, beyond coding. So when I graduated, as I mentioned to you guys, I was doing Unix system administration, which the company that hired me was stunned that college students could, could fathom something like Unix. And for me, like I told you, it wasn't my burning passion. It was kind of something an advisor told me to take. So that wound up uh, getting me my first job. My first job, I had to work on nine different Unix platforms, and we really were building the protocols of what we now call the internet. So unbeknownst to me, and I wish I could tell you I was looking years ahead and saw this all coming and got in early, I, I kind of was the driftwood that washed in with the tide when the, when the internet came in. But I can say that I was there from the early days and it was an extremely fun, extremely fun ride. The good news is that uh, if you were a, a graduating person from Adams State, by the time uh, 2020 comes around, you'll work in a job that hasn't even been invented yet. And I was mentioning upstairs that uh, some speaker came in and was talking to one of our, I think I was a junior then, and he, and he used actually this line. And I thought in the back, I was like, yeah, right, come on. I mean, now I'm going to go get a job. I'm going to be a coder, and then I'll code. And there have been coders since like the 60s. And so that's like, I know what I'm doing. If I look at my resume, the job titles that I've held through my career, he's almost to the year exactly correct. Um, you know, uh, things like application server engineer. Like, that didn't exist in 1989. So the good news is that if you were embarking on a career in the IT industry right now, um, you will be working very soon on things that didn't exist. I mean, think about smartphones 15 years ago. I mean, that, that you know, the idea that my mom has a smartphone freaks me out a little bit, you know what I mean? Not because not it was my mom, but it's just like it is just everywhere. It's pervasive. Um, that is, that is uh, the trend that we're on. The other good news is that it is the younger generation graduating from college right now that are going to invent those new jobs. So when we talk about things like social networking, I mean, you know, obviously that was, you know, the, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world coming out of college and inventing companies like Facebook and so forth, right? It, it's, it's those types of trends. So it's not going to be, um, you know, an old fart like me that's going to sit out there and say, well, here's the next trend and this is how you do it. it the odds of that happening are extremely small. So I think that's terrific news. Uh, how much will I make? This, by the way, was my burning question. Is there Thunder Chief Liquors still in town? Is, this, is, that, is that even around? What is it, Chief? Oh, yeah. So way back, way back, you know, I think... Colorado was a state when I was going here, but like way back, way back, it was called B&V Liquors, and that actually uh, is where I worked, worked my, my way through college. Um, I made the smallest fraction above minimum wage there, so this was an extremely pressing question for me. I wasn't really sure that people, A, could get employed with a computer science degree, B, would you make anything more than you would waiting tables or bartending, um, so this was always a big question for me, and there wasn't the, the vast wealth of data available to be able to go out there and take a look. So when I went and got my first job, the guy offered me uh, uh, a, a number uh, that blew me away. It was like four times more than I was making at the liquor store. I could not believe it. It was in downtown Denver. I got an apartment, and the guy said, hey, congratulations, you qualify for the big discount because you're low income. 
I was so deflated. I was like, I thought, I thought I'd hit the jackpot. I'm low income. I couldn't believe it. So uh, then I kind of realized that I think the guy that hired me, great guy, I think he kind of lowballed me and expected me to come back and go, huh, I'm not working for that. Double it and we'll start talking. No, I snapped up the first offer that came to me. So the lack of information there, um, you know, probably uh, uh, didn't, didn't serve me well. These are some numbers. And by the way, these are not entry level uh, uh, jobs, but you can do some quick math for Colorado entry level. Take those numbers and do 60% in your brain. And that's about what you can expect in Colorado. Uh, and I say this year, it was actually 2015. You'll also notice, and uh, someone upstairs pointed this out to me, and uh, uh, it's an extremely important point. There, are, And you guys correct me when I screw this up, but like there's like a computer science degree and an IT degree. They're, they're kind of two separate programs. I'm not here to say one's better than the other, but you'll notice that the salaries are slightly different on the right-hand side of this versus the left-hand side of this. These are for mid-career um, uh, uh, mid type averages. So this includes entry level averaged in with people with 30 years, everything kind of munged all together. Um, so I would just point that out. Also, if you look down at the bottom, you'll, if you can, so there is computer programmers um, and there is software developers, but if you take a look at the other ones, again, it's not the, the jobs, if you will, the big bucket jobs out there aren't necessarily coding. So you'll do much better than average. That's good. So uh, well done if you've decided to do that. Uh, there has never been a dip in demand for IT engineers in the 50 years that IT has been around. So that's like really good news. I'm not sure that anything except cocaine dealers can sport numbers like that. I think I, I'm pretty proud of our industry for that. The industry being IT, not cocaine dealers. Um, <laughs> obviously this varies by location, by job title. If you work out in the Silicon Valley, these numbers aren't even gonna cover your rent. So I mean, uh, it's gonna vary very uh, widely depending on, on where you are and experience. And we'll talk a little bit more about experience here in a bit. Okay, where will I work? Um, these are, it's a graph of computer programmers. I know I wasn't gonna talk about coding, but these are, this is the only numbers I've got. So if you take a look at how much do you make and where do you make it? I, I mentioned this upstairs. There's a weird anomaly right here on the western slope of Colorado um, that it turns out that's a, it's a hotbed right now. Uh, you can get folks from California to sell their 800 square foot house for $83 billion and go buy up half of Grand Junction and move out to Colorado and they're very, they're very amiable to that. Um, so that's a, an anomaly out there. But in all honesty, you probably won't work in IT if you're around where they make cars or cactus or, or uh, corn. There's uh, the, the rust belt in the Midwest, uh, there's not a lot of opportunities there. A lot of the uh, large prairie industrial areas and the deserts, there aren't. Exception being Phoenix is a hotbed right now. I mentioned the anomaly of the western slope of Colorado. Go figure. Uh, and Alaska, if you want to go to Alaska. Lots of opportunities up there. Um, but uh, there is a good uh, cost of living to uh, salary ratio here in Colorado. Uh, if you look, the Front Range is well represented, Boulder area. But to be honest, it's getting less and less important where you live. Um, so many jobs are remote, virtual teams, are the big thing, distributed corporations are a big thing right now. So it's not terribly important that you know the zip code of where you want to go. You probably can do whatever you want to do wherever you want to do it. Obviously, when I graduated uh, uh, Adams State, there wasn't a lot from an IT perspective going on in the San Luis Valley, and hence why I said I had to go to 16 countries to try to figure out how to earn a paycheck, right? But that's not necessarily true. I guess Alamosa is kind of in this area here. So for those of you working in IT in the San Luis Valley, my hat's off to you. You are, you are a stat of yourselves. Let's talk about what you're gonna get paid for. This, uh, I was very fortunate to have some mentors along the way that imparted upon me wisdom I never would have learned on myself. I mentioned Ron Lozier and George Selman earlier as folks that kind of pointed me in the right direction. But I did have one, um, uh, one mentor who talked about it's how crucial it is, and I think this applies not just IT, this is across the board. You need to know why you're being paid. And I think a lot of people say, well, I'm being paid because I'm an employee. No, but I mean, at more, at more of a core value. When you are graduating college, you're gonna get paid for your potential. 
And that was something I didn't really understand. My first job interview, which by the way was with Command Sciences up in Colorado Springs, very conservative company, uh, they were making software that was in Cheyenne Mountain. And I went to the interview. I had really, as Cameron will re probably remember, I had like really, really long hair and tattoos and a pierced ear. And, you know, I wasn't the respectable young gentleman that you see in front of me now. But uh, I went up to the interview. I bought a new suit, got all my hair hacked off. I even shaved. Like, I went into the interview, went through it. And they're like, no, 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 you're not it. And I was like, well, what, what the heck? Like, I thought I nailed it. Well, apart from the fact I left my earring in, which was probably not the right thing to do. Um, apart from that, I thought that if I went in there and impressed on them, well, I can code in Fortran, I can code in Pascal, I can code in C, and I can probably whip this stuff into shape. The thing is, they're not hiring me for my skills. I was right out calls. They're hiring me for the potential. What they, what they wanted and what companies to this day want from an entry-level position is the potential. I want to bring someone in. I want to mold them into our image, our culture, our value proposition, and I need someone that's moldable. So I want to hear about someone who's worked as an individual and worked on teams someone who's excelled in real academic, uh, hands-on, analytical type work, and someone who is really good at building teams and nurturing people in relationships. That's the type of person, because the potential on a person like that is astronomic. So coming out of the gates, that's what you get paid for. At some point, though, you are going to have to develop skills. You, if you're 10 years into your career and you're still being hired for your potential, something hasn't happened, right? So at some point you do need to uh, uh, gather some skills around resume building, certifications, things like that. That's a great time to start talking about all the wonderful programming languages that you know. Your pay is going to go up commensurate. At some point you're going to be an expert at something. And that development curve of becoming an expert, that's when you're going to start differentiating yourself from uh, your peers, uh, not in a superiority type way, but in a selectivity type way. I'm really good at Unix operating systems. I don't do anything with iOS. I don't do anything with Windows. I'm, this is my specialty. At some point, you may, like George, be hired for your opinion. Um, and, and this is where you're actually not delivering anything of tangible value. Um, <laughs> you, you, you are going out and you're giving your opinion on, I think the best way to architect a web application is a three-tier architecture with a web, a business, and a data, database layer. I think that is the way to do it. It's the most scalable, most secure, and most practical, and most economic way of doing that. And someone says, that's amazing. You just saved us a lot of money. You didn't actually build it. You didn't actually design it. You just gave your opinion. Um, that is when the money starts uh, uh, cranking up. At some point, um, and this doesn't happen to everyone, but for some strange people, you're known for your name. That's Mark Zuckerberg, by the way. Our, our, our Facebook buddy there, but um, to where your, your opinion actually gets over amplified because you have a name. If Michael Jordan came in to talk about IT, people would probably go listen. Uh, what Michael Jordan knows about IT, I don't really know. By the way, for you millennials, Michael Jordan was a basketball player back in the 1990s. <laughs> I'd point that out, um, clarify that a little bit. Uh, but anyway, this is the trend. It's very important to understand what stage you are in your career and what you're being paid for. Get those wrong and you're going to have a very rocky career. Um, how your garden grows. So uh, this is how compensation is going to uh, be over time. And I mentioned upstairs, if you happen to be a left-winging trade unionist, you're going to be really upset with this part of the presentation. But basically, your salary will change over time based on several factors. So the first one is, if you're in a union, your pay will go down, your job security will decrease. And I apologize to anyone in this room who happens to be in a union. This just happens to be the statistics. In IT, IT is a union-free industry for the most part. There are some trade unions in Europe, and having dealt with them, that's an exception. But for the most part, it's an industry that's invented itself, and one of the core values from the beginning of IT is there are no unions. That has allowed salaries to increase tremendously. I mentioned 50 years of, of, uh, of employment demand, nonstop. Uh, I'm not here to bash unions. I'm just saying the numbers say that if you're in a union, you're in a losing proposition. Enough of my soapbox. There are contract positions. NFL players happen to be contract players, right? They negotiate, although their numbers are probably a little bit higher on the graph, they do negotiate for a fixed rate for a fixed period of time. So in effect, your salary is flat. You're losing money, if you will, if you're a business major. And 
believe in the uh, you know the cost of tomorrow's dollar. Um, that you're, 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 you're kind of static, but you're losing with inflation a little bit over time. I'm not saying that's wrong. Like I say, if someone wanted to give me an NFL salary, I'd probably accept. Um, what most people, uh, oh, a, a great proportion of society is on some sort of cost of living adjusted uh, uh, income where you get a proportional increase every year. You get your, you know, your single digits uh, of, of merit increase every year. Um, those are out there, uh, some very, very satisfying jobs, certainly in government, certainly in nonprofits uh, that follow that curve. For the most part, most of IT fits on a geometric curve. That's for the math major. I put that term on there. That's, that's like a good, a good math term, right? Where you've got a certain amount of uh, percentages, you typically will get a salary, you typically will get benefits, you typically will get bonuses, uh, you typically will get things like vacation and medical coverage. Some companies, you may get profit sharing, you may get pension and retirement. But the idea here is that over time, your salary is going to increase. That's great. That's wonderful. All of us, you know, have got bills to pay. This is a great way to accomplish that task. The curve I really want to talk about is the exponential curve. And this was something pointed out to me, again, by, by a mentor. They said, you have to have an exponential curve. And the exponential curve is that passion. It's your home run. It's writing a book. It's creating a startup. It's... Uh, doing a screenplay, creating a picture. Um, it, it's that thing that, that, that keeps you up at night. Those have the potential of going, uh, by the way, you'll notice they start at zero because passions typically are not the most profitable things. That's why they're passions and not businesses. But at some point, if you get very good at your passion and you get very good at that, you can get on this exponential curve. I mean, like a J.K. Rowling, for instance, you know, um, that had this passion about writing books and then wound up getting one of the you know, largest uh, uh, author empires out there. That, that's a passion. And the, the advice that was given to me, and it's something that I've treasured ever since it got into this thick skull, was you have to have both. It is terrific to have a day job. And until those two lines of the graph cross, you're going to be in your day job. But you can't give up on your passion. You have to be coding that project off to the side. You have to be talking with your buddies. Hey, what if we started a company that sold databases to the government of Malaysia? By the way, that is one of the bizarre things. I, I made not a thin dime off of it, by the way. But, you know, that was something that we got kicking around. You know, what if we did that? Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, by the way, these databases were for their radar system. If they'd have bought them for me, they wouldn't have lost an airplane. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but um, that exponential curve is so key. Um, not just from an economic point of view, but when you do your day job, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of us have day jobs that aren't thoroughly thrilling every hour of the day. Um, having that passion that you can come home to, whether it's graphic art, whether it's uh, making uh, uh, EDM uh, on, on, your, on your console, on your laptop, whether it's uh, you know, kicking everybody's butt at Angry Birds, whatever, whatever that is, um, that's an extremely important, important thing. But here, here's, the, here's the thing, it ain't all about money, right? And normally people that say that have a lot of money. But I'm not saying that's me. I'm just saying that in your day job, um, there's a lot more out there. We, we talked uh, this morning about folks that do work in the government or in nonprofits or in uh, special cause organizations or non-government uh, organizations. There's an awful lot of people that have that burning passion, that exponential curve, that say, I'm not waiting for those two lines to cross. I'm going to go chase my passion now. We, we mentioned, like, you know, I'm going to save all the whales in the rainforest. You know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm going to do, do that. So you got to find the right job, right? And this is a job I have not held, by the way. I, I, uh, statistics say that you'll probably work for three to ten companies. I thought the first company I worked, I got hired with out of college, I would probably retire and get a gold watch with, you know, kind of that's what, what you do. I wound up staying at that company for eight months, so that was kind of odd. It was more shocking to me that I was offered uh, not low income salary from another company in Colorado Springs. It was one of our clients, and so I changed jobs. Uh, and, and I remember my father at the time was like, why are you changing jobs? They just hired you. you. You love that company. I was like, I know, but this is in Colorado Springs. It's a little smaller of a town. Uh, I'm going to make quite a bit more money, and that's really good. We're expecting a kid. I think that's going to come in handy. So bouncing around, I'll be honest with you, I don't know how many companies that, that I've, I've worked for. I 
think it's 10, maybe it's 16, I'm not really sure. But the point is you're going to bounce around a lot. The, uh, normally I would say our parents dream, but now I'm, unfortunately because we have some younger folks in the audience, I'm going to have to say our grandparents dream was that you would get hired on and retire at some company. Um, that isn't necessarily the case. And if, for, if you find the right job and you wind up at one company for all of your career, hey, kudos to you. you you've, uh, you've won the lottery. That's amazing. So the most uh, amazing job, I had an opportunity to have a conversation with an author named Daniel Pink. I don't know if you've read any of his books. He's a you know, New York Times bestselling dude. He wrote uh, a book called Drive, a book called uh, uh, Everyone's a Salesperson. Uh, anyway, he summed it up best. He said that the most rewarding jobs have three characteristics across the board, whether you're in the forestry industry, you're in the IT industry, you're saving whales in the rainforest. If you have autonomy, mastery, and purpose, this is the definition of a fulfilling job. And it, it cuts across cultures, geographies, industries, and so forth. So if you can find that job that has that, um, you're right in the happy spot. And I, I hope it's your first job, and I hope you wind up doing that for 78 years. Uh, another thing to remember is you already have a job. You are already the CEO of You Incorporated. You are your primary shareholder. You are chairman of the board. You are CEO. Uh, very frequently, you do have shareholders, people in your family, kids, parents, what have you, that have a vested interest in your personal corporation success. But a key thing to remember is that you need to define what your corporate uh, goals are and have frequent board meetings. So sometimes you need to take a day off work, sit down with a blank piece of paper, which, by the way, is one of the most scary things you'll ever do, and just start doing the what do I want to be when I grow up and, and refine that and figure out what is... What is it that is my purpose? What is it that I want to be the master of? What is it that I want autonomy to go pursue? And come up with that definition. I will give you a story about a company that I worked for that had a plant that needed to close down in Leavenworth, Kansas. This was 1992. And I was one of 12 people in the company that knew that 120 people were going to lose their job the following Tuesday. And my part of the job was to break into the computers in Kansas, siphon off all of the data, and set up a network for the, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like 25 of the people in that plant that were going to keep their job, that were going to be brought back out. And I went into one of the gentlemen that was in charge. Uh, he was like the, the program manager for this. This was a big government contract. Um, and I asked him, I said, do we know who the 25 are that are going to wind up keeping their job. He goes, well, we haven't really decided yet. And I was like, well, I need to know because if it's a coder, I need to set up the network one way. If it's a manager, I don't even know they need a computer. Um, you know, and I can go down the list and I need to know like, who they are and what their positions are. And this guy, and I'm not making this up, said, well, I've been putting this off for a long time. And he brought out a green bar printout. And for the millennials in the group, the old computers used to have these pieces of paper that zigzagged and came out of her printer and had little holes down the side. And it was a list of all the employees that were in the Leavenworth branch. And he took his pen and he went, and he went down the list. He was like, don't know him, don't know him, don't know him. Yeah, we'll keep him. Uh, maybe. Uh, no, 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 no. He went through a list of 120 people in a few minutes. I did the math later and I found out that on average, each line of that printout, which is some person, someone's career, someone's parent, uh, got on average six seconds of consideration. I found out later one of the gentlemen that was let go had 28 and a half years at the company. So he was 18 months away from retirement. He got let go. And I was sitting there going, oh my gosh, like what printout in somebody's desk am I on that I'm going to get my six seconds of consideration one day? Like that is so cold hearted. And I was young enough in the industry that it was just a real slap in the face for me. You know, and I was like, you know what? I've got a green bar list in my desk and it's got my employer on it. I only have one line. I need to give them six seconds of consideration and if I ever figure out, eh, don't know them, God. I need to be as loyal to them as they are to me. And I know that's mercenary, I know that's cynical, but that actually is the real world out there. And if you don't look after your rights and fire them at your earliest convenience, they certainly will return the favor. And I'm not trying to bash employers or whatever. I'm just saying you are the president of you incorporated. If you're not working in your passion, if you're not able to pursue your exponential curve, then you may need to fire your employer. And after all, it, it, it's your job. It's not their job, right? This is you. This is your life. So... Um, I think that's important anyway. Like I said, I wish I could say I invented that or whatever, but that, there wasn't. There was a 
gentleman that taught me that. Was, was there a question? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. Now you almost got to have to come up with a question, right? <laughs> so this is interesting. I had an opportunity to talk to a gentleman um, three weeks ago. And I, I, I uh, was able to pose a question to him. I said, hey, I'm, I'm going to be presenting uh, a place called Adams State College to uh, a bunch of students who may be embarking on the IT industry. And if you were getting into the IT industry today, like what field would you pick? I mean, I know I got my biases and so forth, but like, but like what would you pick? This was his answer. This is a, a transcription of the conversation. So I know it's small print and you'll have to read it, but it's exactly how he said it. So it's not perfect grammar. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, you know, uh, New York Times literature, but uh, if you want to read that, that's fine. I did point out the answers are in red. Uh, he, he thought anything that was in the personalized con uh, consumer product thing, maybe like robots. I understand you guys got a robotics lab here. Oh, yeah. How about ass is that? <laughs> Artificial intelligence. At the end, he said, I'd probably still maybe like to get my, my, my hands on uh, some of the hardware things. So that was uh, Steve, oh, I'm sorry. Click the, that was Steve Wozniak that I was able to talk to out in Las Vegas at a conference I was speaking at. And uh, so anyway, Woz knows about Adam State. <laughs> but uh, that, that, was, that was kind of a, a highlight for me, kind of hearing what his thinking was. You know, obviously having worked with Steve Jobs, started Apple Computer, started, uh, he's now at a company called Primary Data. By the way, if you guys want to start up to throw some money into it, that might not be a bad one. Um, but he's, he's obviously accomplished uh, so much and is one of the few rock stars still living in our industry. Um, so getting his opinion on what he would jump into right now um, is, is really cool. But I think even more important than the words that he spoke was how he talked about it. his eyes lit up and he got animated and he got fired up and he still is excited about working in IT now. A guy that, I mean, by all measures has done it all and he still gets fired up with that. He told a story about that when he goes through the airport, uh, TSA absolutely hates him because uh, one time he lost the suitcase and it had uh, uh, one of the brand new iPhones. It hadn't been released yet. And it was, it was one of the prototypes. And, and it got stolen, misplaced, mislaid. Um, they went around yelling at TSA people and it miraculously was found. Um, so, but anyway, he tried to, they asked him, well, how much uh, is the iPhone, uh, like how much is that? And he was like, oh, I don't know, 600 bucks. And the guy nudged him and said, uh, no, it's the only one of its kind. It's probably worth about seven or eight billion dollars. I think we need to find it. So he still gets fired up about that. He says he travels with 40 gadgets, that that's what he plays around with. That's his fun time. That's his exponential curve, if you will. And certainly he's proven that exponential curves can be rather profitable. Anyway, not just name dropping that, yes, I, 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 I talked to Steve Wozniak, but hey, I freaking talked to Steve Wozniak. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So anyway, um, kind of collapsing this all down, I tried to come up with a list of 10 things that I wish I knew when I was embarking on this bizarre adventure uh, that I call my career. Uh, things that I wish I knew that I didn't, things that I learned the hard way. Uh, mistakes I made or mistakes I avoided become, because someone with gray hair uh, was able to point me in the right direction. So the first thing, and you guys heard me mention this upstairs, million dollar ideas are a dime a dozen. It took me a long time to realize this. I think the American dream is, you know, if you build a better mousetrap, they'll beat the path to your door. It actually is not true. There are so many success stories out there that didn't happen. DOS in 1980 was not the best personal computer operating system it wound up ruling the world. Microsoft was not the most successful software engineering company from a technical point of view. Didn't do too bad. Um, you know, uh, there are uh, Betamax and VHS, that's VCR technology, and for you millennials, VCRs are what we used to put movies into. Yeah, you do, <laughs> see, see. But, you know, these are examples where the, the best technology didn't actually win. So these million dollars idea, we were talking about what? Uh, suit jackets with hoodies built in the back, right? Million dollar idea. What really is the million dollar idea is the ability to execute on a rather good idea. The million dollar part of the idea has nothing to do with the idea. 
It has to do with the execution of that. That was a hard lesson for me to learn. I worked with a lot of really, really smart people who had really, really cool ideas like selling databases to the Malaysian government. It was a terrific idea. When we went out to, to actually execute on that, first off, we found out the profit margins were really small. And then we found out the company we worked for at our day job was already selling databases to the Malaysian government and threatened to fire us all. So it wasn't the best career move. So the execution on that, probably not the, probably not the best exercise of my, of my life. But anyway, something to keep in mind. Another one, I, I learned this from a, a gentleman actually from Hong Kong. This guy had an amazing life story. Um, his folks smuggled him out of Hong Kong, or I'm sorry, out of uh, communist China into Hong Kong. And then he had to smuggle on a trawler to get to Canada. Um, and uh, anyway, this was something that he said. We were working so hard. I had just opened up an office in Amsterdam. I was trying to hire people, get a marketing program put in place, get contracts with the trade unions put in place, all things I knew absolutely nothing about. And we were working so many hours, uh, you know, just uh, uh, an ungodly amount of hours. And he said, we're running too fast. We have to stop to get on our bike. And I said, okay, time out, time out. Ancient Chinese wisdom here. Explain that to me. Right? And so his point was, look, when you're running that fast, there by definition is a better solution because obviously your solution sucks. So almost any other solution out there has to be better. Right? It might not be a supersonic jet, but at least it's a bike. And a bike is a lot better than running. And so we went out there and lo and behold, they've got consultants that know all about marketing and hiring and trade unions and how to speak Dutch. Um, and so <laughs> we were able to bring all of those folks in, the, and they did a terrific job. I mean, it did cost a little bit, but hey, they were able to do it. That was better than us just working harder, harder, harder. This maybe is another adage of the old overused uh, term about, you know, work smarter, not harder. The real, the real answer, by the way, on that is you have to work smarter and harder. So next thing, uh, these are the good old days. Um, when I was at Adams State trying to, to kind of get my head around what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, I kind of thought that the good old days were like I would get out there and like 10 years from now, I would be sitting around the folks that were going to create the good old days, not realizing the good old days were right then. So I got Cameron, who was in the dorm with me way back, way back in the way back. And we've got terrific stories about the good old days. From a technical point of view, it really is amazing. In 1991, I worked at an aerospace company. We had a data center that was many times larger than this room. And we had a computer cluster that was about half the size of this room and cost lots of zeros. And we had these things called disk packs. I probably should have brought one in there. They're kind of cool. But they were disk platters that were about this big and about six of them stacked up. And you went ahead and put them in. And it took a couple minutes for them to actually spin up to speed. And I mean, they were real museum pieces. And I had a clipboard because back then, cool guys had clipboards. And <laughs> I was going around doing the math. And I realized, wait a minute. We have over 1,024 megabytes of disk space online right now. Guys, we just crossed the gigabyte boundary. And there were high fives and everything. And we were, we were like, a gigabyte? Holy cow, what are you going to do with a, giga, a gigabyte? Are you kidding me? You know, this is amazing stuff. And I remember telling that story to my daughter. And she, this was probably about five or six years ago. And she pointed out, she goes, Dad, do you do know that you can't even buy anything in a gigabyte now. Like if you buy a flash stick, the smallest you can get is four gigabytes. And that's something that's going to fit in your pocket. And that was half a room. I was just like, wow, that's amazing. Wow, we were so excited. And I mean, there was, I don't know, 100 people's annual salary worth of equipment sitting in that room to get that gigabyte. But see, at some point, that story turns from being ultra geeky and ultra outdated to being kind of retro cool, you know what I mean? And so those were the good old days. I, I know what a Hollerith card is. I had someone on my team that knew how to do key punch. And for those of you who don't know key punch, that makes me even cooler because <laughs> this arcane piece of paper that we're going to poke holes in and somehow that represents a line of data. That kind of stuff is amazing. Like, I can't believe it's been 27 years since I was drinking beer in Coronado Hall. You're not allowed to do that, by the way. Don't do that. Um, and so <laughs> those were the good old days, right? Uh, and so I would just say for all of you, that, that, you know, cherish the times right now, the, the friendships, the, the memories, the stories 
Uh, they're all going to get priceless. And like my stories, every year they get a little bit better. I think of new stuff to add to them. Okay. Uh, your network is way more important than your resume. This, uh, I, and I, I talked a little bit. I had an opportunity um, a few years back to cash in all of my stock. I was with a company that went very big, very fast. I cashed in all my stock and I retired. And that kind of sounds cool and nifty and everything, but it actually turned into be one of the most miserable times of my life. It was uh, really hard. I was, uh, you talk about mastery, autonomy, and purpose. I had like off the charts autonomy. Nobody gave a crap what I did, right? <laughs> mastery, I was the master of absolutely nothing. And purpose, I had no purpose whatsoever. And it turns out that that's a really bad combination to have, right? This is how drug habits started, you know? Uh, I'm not saying I had drug habits. I'm just saying that that's how people with a lot of autonomy, no mastery, and no purpose, that is something that happens quite frequently. I realized that uh, my life was not going the direction it should. I sat down with my blank piece of paper, the scary experience I talked about, and tried to decide what I wanted to be when I was going to uh, when I was going to mature. And much to my surprise, it was go back into the IT industry. I was like, I just left that. Like that stuff drives me crazy. That stuff never stays the same. It's always changing. You're never an expert for more than ten minutes. And I decided I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to do that. Well. I know lots of people, this should be easy. And it was extremely hard. It took, it took me about two years to find a job again. Mainly because I was like, well, I'll go in at the executive level, I'll do this. And I finally wound up having to come in as an entry level pro project manager at the age of 43. Not a good time to start at the bottom again. Uh, so that was a very humbling experience. I found out that the network I thought I had was as fragile as China. There were people that were my friends because I had a title and a lot of budget and I could spend money with their company. Take all of that away and I, I really wasn't very impactful on any of their lives. It turns out I, was, I got a job and uh, have now, over a period of years, I'm slightly older than 43, um, I've, I've uh, worked my way back into the game again. Um, but that was a very, very rude awakening for me. And it didn't really matter what I had. My resume was impeccable. I had. You know, I had all kinds of great and terrific, wonderful things, including Adam State on my resume. Um, and it didn't really make a crap. It really didn't. It was the people that I, that I knew that actually helped me get back into the game. But that took an awful long time. Nowadays, of course, with networking, it's a, it's a lot different than back in the Stone Ages, right? I mean, we've got LinkedIn. We've got Facebook. My son's got me on a great social networking site called Twitter. You guys use Twitter? I'm meeting a lot of women, but... Like, I can't find out what the professional connection is there. For you guys not laughing, Twitter's a dating site. I'm not really trying to social network on a dating site. But there's every type of social networking that's out there, right? There's professional organizations. There's everyone that likes the Denver Broncos. Yay, Broncos. You know, there's all of that stuff that's out there. That actually is more important than what it says on your resume. I did uh, mention to the folks upstairs earlier that if any of you guys want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, I work for a company called Trace3. So if you look Mark Campbell Trace3, fire me an invite. I'm, I'm pretty easy with my network. But anyway, I think that is, is very crucial. The folks that you are meeting in college, think about this. They are at the same stage of their career as you are. Therefore, they're going to get their first job about the time you do. They're going to get the decision of do I go management or do I stay technical about the same time you do. I've got kids. Should I go for the job I love or the job that actually pays? They're going to go through that decision point at the same time you do. And it may not even be your college uh, uh, peers. It may be the folks that hire on at the first company that you wind up with that are going to have the same thing. Fast forward 20 years, these are the guys that are going to make vice president at the same time you do. They're going to start their own company and try to figure out how to get venture capital at the same time you do. Um, that's a terrifically powerful network. I remember when I was starting, I was thinking, well, if I knew the vice president, and if I knew the president, and if I knew that, that would be like an extremely good set of people to know. And I tried to suck up to those big wigs, all the people with the big mahogany desks and everything, did not merit me one flipping thing. I will say though that there were a couple coders that started out the same time I do that are now CEOs of companies that I know really, really well because we drank beer and corn all together. Um, you know, th there are folks that went through the same sort of trials and tribulations that I did. Um, uh, and, and that type of a network is worth way more than a master's degree or, you know, uh, 
um, I, I worked at this company or that company. You don't always get your uh, way. I think that's a terrific blessing. I was mentioning upstairs, I worked on one of the most amazing projects at a company called MCI. This was back when long distance was something you had to pay for. And we did this uh, kind of blend of artificial intelligence with algorithmic coding to look at call data coming in and make statistical uh, um, uh, trending off of it. At the time, this was early 90s, that was really, really cool. All the, uh, all the big wigs in the IT industry came into our project to see what we were doing. A lot of these guys uh, uh, are, are folks like uh, Grady Booch, he made the language Ada for those of you that, that uh, like that. Uh, Adele Goldberg, she made a language called Smalltalk and helped invent the mouse. Like, who, seriously, someone invented the mouse? Yeah, somebody did. So they all came in and talked to our group. It was an amazing group. And uh, we worked at that. We got some patents granted. Uh, and it turns out that uh, we didn't make the company one thin dime and we all got fired. So like that was the bad story about it. It wasn't what I thought. I thought that that, that project was going to be the highlight pinnacle of my career. Um, we all got fired uh, or sent. Uh, I was actually, uh, I didn't actually get fired. I got put on a project that was moving to Council Bluffs, Iowa. I think that's a place, right? I was like, holy cow, wait till I tell my wife about that. <laughs> like this has been a rather bad day at work. So I was very dismayed. I thought they had lost their mind. I thought from being the pinnacle of my career, I just hit the, the, the abyss of my career. It turns out because we were fired, um, our team had about 12-ish people. Um, about nine of us wound up at a little teeny startup up in Denver that got bought by a slightly bigger but teeny tiny startup um, out of San Jose. And we wound up being the fastest company on this planet's history to hit a billion dollars in sales. Uh, we did a, a billion dollars after uh, uh, 58 months it took us um, to where we were doing a billion dollars a year. It was a company called BEA Systems. And had I not have gotten canned from this awesome, wonderful, terrific job that I had and been forced, you know, kind of foot in the middle of the back, pushing me out of the airplane, I wouldn't have known I had a parachute, right? So you don't always get what you want. I've had, unfortunately, three or four other of these. I talked about uh, retiring, I was, uh, and I was going to become a professional pool player because that's like a really cool thing to do. And it turns out I'm not that good of a pool player. <laughs> that's one of the things you need to be a professional pool player. Uh, but because of that, I had to go through this arduous cycle of trying to start from the bottom again and work my way up. I was very embarrassed about it. A lot of my peers were off on to great and wonderful things. It was a very, very difficult time for me. But I, I do think it makes what I do for a living right now, I can do it like almost nobody I know because these startup folks are trying to claw their way from the bottom. And I know what I look for when I make recommendations about investments into these startups. I'm looking for that grit. I'm looking for that person that's willing to work at a liquor store to put themselves through college. I'm, look, I'm looking for that person that's willing to humble themselves and go start at the bottom again and climb their way all the way back up to the, to the top. It's that intangible thing that's what I'm looking at. And the only reason I think I'm pretty good at that is because I've been there myself, right? So I think that those types of, uh, you know, the school of hard knocks, I think that's actually a, a very, very big blessing that we get. Oh, I, I did too. Exponential, we talked about that. Um, make sure you keep your exponential growing. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to figure out what that is. I mean, maybe it's dubstep music, maybe, you know, whatever. But when you find that, keep working on it. Keep, you know, if it's graphics or what have you, just keep that going. It's very invaluable. Find mentors. Um, I say they have gray hairs and a pleasant smile. And I wasn't just talking about George. But uh, that's, I've had some folks, uh, when I was starting out, there wasn't an awful lot of people that had 20, 30 years experience in the IT industry. They just, they just did not exist. They do exist now. Um, and I was extremely fortunate to have spotted a bunch and, and that were extremely brilliant. And I was just smart enough to listen to them being way smart. Um, to, to benefit from it. And I would recommend that. When you get into your first, uh, your first job or that next job or whatever challenge you're looking at, if you can find a mentor, and, it, and by finding a mentor, I'm not talking about the richest guy or the guy with the biggest desk or the gal that has the most degrees on her wall. I'm talking about a mentor, that person that, that kind of has the same purpose that you do, that has the same passion for, uh, to master the same skills that you do. Those people are invaluable, and it's always so much easier to learn off somebody else's experience than off of your own. 
Staying in a bad job is financially and spiritually ruinous. I was working for a company that you guys all know. Um, I won't say their names, but they take TV directly into your house. <laughs> and um, my, my, group, um, my group was in charge of designing everything that didn't orbit the Earth or sit in your living room. So all the payroll systems, the call systems. Uh, the, the folks on, on my team were the apex of their career, the top network guy, the top storage guy, the top database guy. Um, so it was a real, real... Uh, uh, coveted position to be on, on my team and, and uh, the guys that were on my team were so much smarter than me. They were an amazing, amazing team. However, I worked for a management uh, crew that was the most toxic, um, oh, it was terrible. I could tell too many horror stories. Oh, I'll tell one. So we had an executive there. One of the things he loved to do was make women cry in a public meeting. Now that's a nice guy. Doesn't that instill Ooh, we're going to work late this week. And that's a true story. I saw him do it twice. It was the most embarrassing thing. How did he not get fired? I don't know. I don't know. But that was toxic. Regardless of this awesome team that I had working for me, regardless of the really, really cool stuff that we got to do, this team, uh, from a management point of view, was just horrid. I mean, they should write textbooks about, about this team. My boss, as it turns out, was deathly afraid of his boss. And that had really bad ramifications for me. One time, his boss was on a temper tantrum, and my boss decided he couldn't go to this conference in Las Vegas. And he was going to send me, and I was going to take notes and come back and tell him what the conference was all about. And I was really ticked off because it was the busiest time of year for me and my team. So I went to this conference with an extremely bad attitude. And a couple gentlemen got up to speak, and finally this one guy, who is now my boss, got up to speak, and my notes for his presentation was, I want to work for this guy. I went back, left my job, and change companies. I would like to say that I did that overnight. It actually took me 10 months to get out of that job. But nonetheless, it just became so apparently clear that staying in that job, even though from, let's say, a resume, po a resume point of view, it was amazing. From the people I worked with was amazing. From a managerial point of view, it was the most toxic thing. I would come home in the worst moods. Ah, I must have just been a terrible person to be around back then. And everyone in our organization was. I got over to this new company, the company that I'm at right now, and it was just like this weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. It was, uh, uh, it was the most amazing, amazing thing. So staying in that bad job, again, as I said before, I'm not trying to be you know, counterculture or anything like that, but you gotta fire the man, right? If you get in that job and it winds up being toxic, it would be better for you to quit and miss mortgage payments than to stay in that job. So. Now you guys are going to do it and say Mark said it, and then you're going to sue me, and it's going to be terrible. I did have someone that said, you need to burn one bridge every two years. Um, and this sounded really strange to me, so I dug into it a little bit, asked him what he meant. This is a, a Dutch gentleman that mentioned this to me. He said, if you don't have the passion to piss somebody off, you're probably doing the wrong thing, right? Unless you're the Pope, I suppose. But if you're not invested enough in what you're doing to where you're going to put personalities, opinions, you know, popularity uh, up to jeopardy by standing up for what you believe in, you're probably doing the wrong thing. By the same token, if you're doing that every month, you're probably doing the wrong thing. So a good rate tends to be about burn one bridge every two years. And that seems about right. So uh, if, if, you're, if you've got that ratio there, that's my number two uh, number two things. I think that is very, very important. Number one is you need to be darn proud of where you come from. Don't hang your heads in a job interview when they say, what college did you go to? You say Adam State and they say, where's that? Um, one of the statements up there, I've worked with an awful lot of Ivy League people. I've worked with a lot of uh, uh, Cal Berkeley, Stanford, MIT, Columbia, Cornell folks. Every one of those people have worked for me not the other way around. So that didn't happen day one, but I, I'm just saying that it isn't necessarily where you go to college and what it says on the resume, it's what you do with it. That, that's the important part. So when you get into that job interview and where did you go to college, you need to belt out Adam State as if they invented the Saturn V rocket, you know? Because I mean, Adam State really has an, and I'm not here as an Adam State commercial, even though a lot of my money goes to pay tuition for some of my kids here. Um, this is a terrific place. I, I can't complain in the least. 
Uh, the education that I got here uh, has served me very well. The things I was exposed to uh, have served me very well. So that would be something that if there's one takeaway, I would, I would put that on there. That is all that I've got, if there are any questions or anything. Wow. I, I rattled.